Amen, amen. We are indeed thankful. We're grateful to the God of heaven for this day, this being the first day of the week, uh, the day in which the world recognizes the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and for that we ought to be eternally thankful because we know that it was through the resurrection of Jesus that man can be saved, the man can be justified, the man has the hope of eternal life, and so we ought to be thankful that even the world today takes some time out of their busy and hectic schedules to acknowledge the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're here for the first time at the Clark County Church of Christ, we want you to know you're our honored guest. And we want you to make sure that you, you fill out a business card while you're here. And you make sure you fill out one of these um, door prizes that we got back here uh, for you. So we want to make sure that you feel welcome and comfortable here at the Clark County Church of Christ. And we want you to know that we love you. And we don't want this to be your last uh, visitation here with us at Clark County. And uh, for all of our members, if you have a prayer request, make sure you fill out the yellow, yellow card and get it to me. Uh, before the end of the sermon. You know, in life, there are some associations that are inextricably linked together. In other words, try as you may to pull them apart, to break them apart, you just can't do it. As a matter of fact, these associations are so strongly linked together that if I were to give you half of the association, you could tell me, the other half. For example, if we were talking about food, and I said cake and you would say ice cream, right? Right, because cake and ice cream go together, right? If we were talking about food and I said macaroni and y'all sound like y'all hungry. <laughs> if I said M and you would say M's. If we were talking about entertainment, and I said, Earth, Wind, and Frankie Beverly, and Peanut Butter. See, you would know, right? Because these associations so, are so strongly attached that even if you tried to break them apart, you couldn't, right? And so these associations are so, so strong. But there's a greater association that is forever linked that you cannot break apart, you cannot sever, you cannot divorce, and that's Christ and the church. If you will, look at Ephesians chapter 5. Notice this association. Just like you can't separate cake and ice cream, you can't separate macaroni and cheese, you can't separate Frank and Beverly and maize and earth, wind, and fire, you cannot separate these things. You cannot separate or divorce Jesus from his church. In Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse number 22, Paul will say, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Notice what he says now. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be their own husbands in everything. Then he says, Husbands, Love your wives, how? Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So men ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it even as the Lord the church. Then he says in verse number 30, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Therefore, notice now, the connection all this time has been the identity of marriage. So here's the thing. Paul says, you don't have to understand Hebrew. You don't have to understand Aramaic. You don't have to understand Greek. What you should be able to understand is that the reason that there's an association between Christ and the church, God gave us a beautiful picture when he gave us the origin, origination of marriage. If you can understand marriage, you can understand Christ and the church. Right. Notice what he says now. He says that we are members of his flesh, members of his body, we're members of his bones, and then he says for this cause. What cause? For the cause of marriage. For this cause shall a man leave his mother and his father and cleave unto his wife, and the twain shall be one flesh. 
So brothers and sisters, friends and neighbor, if you can understand the concept of marriage, you can understand Christ and the church. Notice now, verse number 33, Paul says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and, just like macaroni and, peanut butter and, Frankie Beverly and, Hootie Blowfish and, Jesus and the church. But it's interesting. I wonder where Paul got this from. You know where Paul got this from? Paul got this from creation. Go back and look at Genesis. Because Paul quoted what Moses said in creation. Paul said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Now, see, all you got to do is understand marriage. Don't you like marriages? Don't you like going to a wedding? You think about when's the last time you've been to a wedding? Been to a straight wedding. It's interesting that when you read the Bible, God never even talks about homosexual marriages. Why? Because in the mind of God, they don't exist. Two men together is not a marriage. Two women together is not a marriage. That's why every time God talks about marriage, it's a man and a woman, a man and his wife, a man and his bride. And that's why the church, Christ and the church, is liking to marriage because somebody got to be the head and somebody got to submit. And so we see that in marriage. Go back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 18. Genesis 2.18, you know what God saw? Genesis 2.18, God saw, God says, for it is not good that the man should be alone. God saw that even before the, the world was overly populated, even when there was nobody but man by himself, God says it's not good for a man to be alone. So what God says, what I'm going to do, since it's not good for a man to be alone, man needs somebody that's suitable to him. He needs somebody who is a companion to him. He needs somebody just like him. Now, the thing I know about God when I look in scripture, God has a sense of humor. You know, sometimes people think of God as this evil dictator, this evil tyrant. He can never be pleased. He can never be satisfied. But when you read about God, you find out God has a sense of humor. The reason I say that is because look at the next verse. Genesis 2.18, God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make him and help me for him. But what does God make? In verse 19, and out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. But for Adam, there was not found somebody who was suitable for him. So you would think if God is saying, it is not good for man to be alone. And God has said, I'm going to make somebody for you. Why is the very next thing God makes animals? Well, what God did, God wanted to get Adam some responsibility. And so what God told Adam to do, Adam, what I want you to do, I want you to name all of these animals that come in front of you. You name every one of them. And the Bible says what Adam did, Adam gave names to every cattle, to all the fowls of the air, to every beast of the field. But in verse number 20, Adam looking and smelling at all these animals all day, every day. Adam said, mm-mm, that's not for me. That's not for me. That cow not for me. That chicken is not for me. That donkey is not for me. Now, that may taste good on a plate, but it's not companion enough for me. I need a helpmate for me. So you know what God does? The Bible says, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to, to come upon Adam, and he slept. He slept, and God took one of Adam's ribs and closed up the flesh in the stair thereof. And you know what God did? God brought forth a woman out of the side of Adam. God, the Bible says, God brought her forth out of his ribs, and God brought her into the man. You think about going to a wedding, and your bride standing there, and God walking her down the aisle? God brought her to Adam. And you know what Adam did when he saw Eve? The very first woman. He's been looking at animals all day, naming animals all day. Adam has said, whoa. Wow. Oh, you just going to do it like that, God? You going to do it like that? That's what we doing now? Adam said, she shall be called woe, man. Why? Because she was taken out of man. And Adam said, for this cause, 
For this cause that man has a beautiful bride, shall a man leave his father and his mother, and he shall be glued, cemented together with his wife. The problem nowadays, because we live in this litigious society where everybody want to get married on Friday, and then they want to get in the normal on Monday, God said, no, we need this thing to be glued together. We don't need no Elmer's glue. We don't need no school glue. We don't need that other glue. We need some gorilla glue. Marriage and all to stay together. God decreed that from beginning. Why? Because what Paul said was that was a pattern for the church. He says this is a great mystery for I speak concerning Christ and the church, but he is drawing off the illustration of marriage. So if you can understand a man with his wife, you can understand the relationship between Christ and his church. One man, one bride. And it's interesting, if you think about that, if you think about how marriage is so sacred and is so important that God would designate the church to be patterned after the concept of marriage. It's interesting, you stay there. One thing that you learn from Genesis chapter 2, the first thing you learn, woman, woman was made for man. Notice now, Genesis 2.18, God said it is not good for a man to be alone, so God made him a woman. A woman is made for a man. The second thing you learn about marriage is woman is made from man because she was made from his rib. When you get to Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 20, woman was named by man. Genesis 3.20, and Adam called his wife named Eve. Not only that, when you get to Genesis chapter 5 and verse number 20, when they got married, when you saw Eve, guess who you saw? Genesis 5.2 says, Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. So when you saw Eve and you saw Adam and you saw Cain and you saw Abel and you saw uh, uh, Enos you know what, and Seth, you know what you saw? You saw the Adams family. Eve was known as Mrs. Adam. The reason I got to say that because nowadays you got women talking about, you know what, we get married, I might not want to take his last name. He sure ain't taking yours. <laughs> Their name was called Adam, and Eve was not afraid or ashamed to be known as the wife of Adam. Right. And so there's some vital things that we learned from marriage in the beginning of time. And so God likened the church to Adam and Eve. So when you read Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3 and you see Adam and Eve and they're in the garden and stuff like that, no, no, don't get sidetracked. What you're looking at, you're looking at a picture of the church. He is a man with his bride and God says, Paul said, this is a great mystery. When you see Adam and Eve, what I'm really talking about is Christ and the church. So, so what's the relationship? Because that's what we're talking about this morning. I'm going to get y'all out of here so y'all can go eat. Get y'all out of here so y'all go and get some macaroni and cheese. <laughs> but this morning we got to talk about Christ and the church. And so when we look at what's the relationship between Christ and the church, there are several things that we need to consider because what you have in the book of Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians, there is a relationship of Christ and the church. Notice now, let's look at a couple passages. One of the dominant things in the book of Ephesians is Christ and the church. Notice now, Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 19. Paul says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this world, but in the world which is to come. And notice now, God has placed all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which heals his body. When you read verse 18 and 19, you got Christ. When you read verse number 22, you got the church. So you got Christ and the church. Look at chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 13. Paul says in chapter 2, Ephesians 2, 13. But now... In Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes are far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Notice now, 
Paul says that at one time, Gentiles, we were separated from God. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes separated are brought nigh, are brought near, are brought closer to God, and it's only through the blood of Jesus. Thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ, which brings us closer, nearer to God. Because what sin does, according to Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, sin separates us. Sin calls us to be at odds in enmity and hostility with God, but the blood of Jesus brings us close in fellowship with God. And so he says now, Ephesians 2, 14, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinance for the making himself of the twain, uh, one new man, so making peace. Notice now, verse number 16, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So in verse 13, you got Christ. Verse 16, you got the church. Look at chapter 3. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. You're not going to be able to escape this conclusion that the New Testament shows us the relationship between Christ and the church. Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 1, Paul says, For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, how that by revelation, Paul says he made known unto me. Now let's start right here for just a moment. Paul says, God gave him revelation. God didn't give Cameron Freeman revelation. Cameron Freeman, those of 2024, we got to do what Paul is going to tell the Ephesians. We got to read. He's not giving to me directly. He's not giving it to you directly. We got to read how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four in three words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, it's imperative that we realize that in 2024, God is not inspiring anybody. God is not giving anybody direct revelation. No, we got to read. We got to study. We got to apply the Bible to our lives. The reason I say that is because, you know what, one thing that we don't like to do as a people, we don't like to read. The reason I know that, the old saying goes, if you want to hide anything from anybody, where do you put it? Put it in the book. Why? Because they're not going to look for it in the book. Because people don't want to read. Paul said, if you want to understand what he is saying about this mystery between Christ and the church, Jew and Gentile, you got to read. Which in other ages it was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles, notice the conclusion, should be fellow heirs and of the same body. Notice now, in Ephesians 3.1, guess who you got? Christ. In Ephesians 3.6, guess what you got? The church. You got Christ and the church. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse number 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro. And caring about with every wind of doctrine. You see, that's the thing that we have to be careful about. You can't believe everything. Some people are so gullible, so naive. You got to realize God gave humanity one body, one body of truth, so all of us can learn and know and practice the same thing. God does not want us to be tossed about with every wind of doctrine. As one man said, you can't be open to everything. You know, some people say, you know, I'm open to this. I'm open to that. Don't be so open-minded that your brains fall out. <laughs> Paul says, don't be cared about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, Verse number 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted. Verse 15, guess who you got? Christ. Verse 16, guess what you got? The church. And when you go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 23, where Paul says, for the husband is the head 
of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. In Ephesians 5, 23, guess who you got? Christ, and guess what you got? The church. So make no mistake about it. Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, you got Christ and the church. You can't get around it. You can't escape it. And so what's the relationship? When you see the relationship between Christ and the church, there are four things that we want to consider. Number one, Jesus is the builder of his church. He's the owner of his church. He belongs to him. He's the head of his church, and he's the savior of his church. And so when you see this relationship, when you see this dynamic between Christ and the church, it's because these things exist. He's builder, he's the owner, he's the head, and he's the savior. So let's look at it. Number one, Jesus had promised to build or establish his church. Quickly, look at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Begin at verse number 13. What we find out, when we think about the basis of New Testament Christianity or the existence of Christianity, where does Christianity originate? Where does it come from? How is it started? Who founded it? Who discovered it? Jesus. That's why it's called Christianity. Christianity has Christ in it. So in Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus came into the culture of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? Now, it's interesting. Jesus asking his disciples, what are the people saying about me? Now, now, that's a very important question. Because depending on what people are saying about Jesus would dictate how people respond to Jesus. If you say the wrong thing about Jesus, you're going to respond to Jesus in the wrong way. So Jesus says, what are men saying about me? And, and, and it's interesting. You know what? We are so blessed nowadays. You know what? We got, we got everything at our disposal on our phone, right? But you know, that was a time, believe it or not, where somebody's word was their bond. Do y'all remember a time when you would drive without GPS and you had to ask people for directions? Do you remember that time where you would be looking for something, driving somewhere, and it was the word of somebody else to get you where you were going. Now, depending on whether or not their word was right would determine whether or not you get lost or late or you don't make it at all. Remember time driving? You had, to, you had to stop and ask for directions. Ask people how to get to where you're going. And sometimes folks would just straight up lie to you. Sometimes people wouldn't even know. And sometimes people say, well, you know, I can, I can vaguely remember. You know what, when you go down here, and you're going to see a tree over here, and when you see that tree, you make sure you, you, you bend that left. Now, if you don't bend that left, now, you know what, you're going in the wrong direction. So it was the word of other people to get you where you were going. Notice now, it's the word of the people, what they are saying about Jesus. What are they saying about Jesus? They said, some say. You've got to be careful about some people say some say that thou art Jeremiah's or Elijah or Jeremiah's or one of the prophets. But Jesus says, but what do you say? Y'all been following me for three years. You've seen the miracles. You see me heal the sick. You see me give a, a, a sight to the blind, a, a hearing ability to the deaf. You see me raise the dead. But what do you say? Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter says, I know who you are. Make no mistake about it. You're not Jeremiah. You're not Elijah. You're not John the Baptist. No, you are the Christ, the son of God, the son of the living God, I might add. Why is that important? What Peter says is, you're the Christ. The word Christ means the Messiah, the anointed one. Christ is not his last name. Some people talk about Jesus and say, Jesus was Christ, as if Jesus is his first name and Christ is his last name. No, Christ is who he is. He is the Messiah. He's the only Messiah. He's the only Christ. It'll never be another Jesus Christ. I don't care what people say. I don't care who they claim to be. You know, it's a guy in Atlanta just got arrested a couple weeks ago claiming to be the Messiah. But there's only one, and he died nearly 2,000 years ago. Not only did he die, he was resurrected. So Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, 
Blessed art thou, Simon, but Jonah for flesh and blood had not revealed unto thee. But my father, which is heaven, and notice what Jesus says. Upon this rock, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, you know the wonderful thing about that? It does not matter what translation of the Bible you read. It all reads the same. We don't have no trick Bibles in the Church of Christ. We don't have some trick wording. Everybody Bibles read the exact same way. So when you read Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church. The question then becomes, did he do it? Did he do it? Because if he did it, I should want to be a member of the church that Jesus promised to build. And so Jesus promised to build his church. Now what is interesting, there were only two groups of people that heard this conversation. God and the apostles. But quickly, go to Matthew chapter 10. I want to show you something. Matthew chapter 10. The only people who were privy to this conversation was God and the apostles of Jesus. But I want you to notice Matthew chapter 10 for this reason. Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, Matthew is going to list the names of the 12 apostles. In Matthew chapter 10, begin at verse number 2. The name of the 12 apostles are these. Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother. So you got the first four. Then you got Philip, you got Bartholomew, you got Thomas, and you got Matthew. Then you got Lebaeus, the son of Alphaeus. Then you got James, Simon Iscariot, uh, Simon, the son of Iscariot, and Judas. You got 12 men who were there with Jesus, right? It's interesting. These are the same 12 men who heard Jesus say that he was going to build or establish his church. It's interesting to me, not one time did these 12 men ever say anything. Why am I saying that? Because it's interesting today that you can go up and down the streets of America and you can see these 12 men's name on buildings and signs that they never promised to build. That's amazing when you think about it. They didn't say anything when Jesus said he was going to build his church, but today I see that name more than I see Jesus' name. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. They heard it. They didn't say anything. They didn't try to stop Jesus. But it's interesting. When you get to New Testament, every one of these apostles, they're members of Christ's church. Quickly, look if you will. Look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 14 on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Peter stood up with the 11. Acts 2, 11. The Bible says, Peter standing with the 11. Now, simple math should tell you, you got Peter and you got the 11. That's 12. Peter standing up with the 11, he lifted up his voice and he said to the men of Judea and to all those who are in Jerusalem, let it be known unto you that this is the thing that God had promised through Joel. And so he's going he's gonna to quote Joel chapter 2. But Peter stood up with the 11 making 12. Now if you back up to Acts chapter 2 and verse number 1. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 1. Now when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, I want you to think about something. Jesus promised to establish his church. Jesus told me it was going to come yet in the future. By the time you read from Matthew chapter 16 to Acts chapter 2, it appeared about 50 some days. The Bible says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. The reason why this is interesting is this. In Acts 2, verse number 1, the pronoun is they. Who are the they that is being referred to? Well, I know I got a lot of teachers in the audience, and I know today we are honoring our educators and we're acknowledging them. And so any English teacher will tell you, if you got a pronoun, a pronoun got to have an antecedent. The nearest antecedent to they, Acts 2, 1, is Acts 1, 26. The apostles, they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the apostles. Why is that important? 
The reason why that is important is because in Acts chapter 1, when they were looking for a replacement to Judas, because you remember Judas committed suicide. They needed one more to fill the place of an apostle, and out of 120 people, they only found one. They only found one. Only one was qualified. So you know what that tells me, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors? We don't have no living apostles today. We don't have none. Not apostles of Christ. And so the apostles of Christ who heard Jesus speak in Matthew chapter 16, they were members of the church that Jesus promised to build. Now when you go back to Matthew chapter 16, verse number 18, Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades should not prevail against it. What does that mean? Jesus was so sure that he was going to establish his church that not even death itself was going to prevent him from establishing his church. Jesus says not even Hades is going to prevent him from establishing his church. Now go back to Ephesians chapter 1 and look at the connection. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 19, what God did, God showed his power when he raised Jesus from the dead. Notice now, Ephesians 1.19, Paul says, Ephesians 1.19, God, and that he might show to us his power, to us who believe, according to his, uh, his mighty power. Then he says, in verse number 20, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. So when we look at Ephesians chapter 1 and we see the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus was resurrected so that he can make good on his promise in Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 13 to establish his church. And when we think about today and we think about the world acknowledging the resurrection of Jesus, one of the reasons Jesus was raised from the dead so that his church could be established. So Jesus is the builder of the church. You gotta ask yourself, where does Christianity come from? Jesus. And so Jesus was saying, not even death itself is gonna prevent him from building his church. Now here's a question for everybody to ponder. Do you know anybody who ever be, built anything after they were dead? I mean, most of the things we see are established and founded while the person is living. Jesus established his church after he died. And so he's the builder, the founder. He's the one who's responsible for the establishment of New Testament Christianity, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that, it belongs to him. He's not only the builder, but he's also the owner. He owns the church. It belongs to him. Quick, look at Acts chapter 20. Look at Acts chapter 20. Look at verse number 28. Who does the church belong to? It belongs to Jesus. And the reason why we need to underscore that is because sometimes we begin to think that the church belongs to us. The church don't belong to us. The church doesn't belong to the oldest member. It doesn't belong to the, the best giver. It doesn't belong to, to, to the most senior or tenured member. No, the church belongs to Jesus. It always has and always will belong to Jesus. In Acts chapter 20, Paul, as he's talking to the elders, Paul tells them to take heed unto themselves and to the flock over to which the Holy Ghost had made them overseers, to feed the church of God that he purchased with his own blood. Now, somebody would say, you know what? See, right there, that proves that you can have church of God and not only church of Christ. And guess what? You're right. But what we got to do, because like we said in Bible class, we got to prove everything. We got to prove everything and hold fast to that which is good. Now, he says the church of God, does it not? Now, the thing about God is, God is the family name for the divine nature. For example, it is just like uh, 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 when you get your mail at your house. When you get your mail at your house, it may have belongs to the Freemans. Why? Because the family name at my residence is Freeman, right? That's right. The family name for the divine nature in heaven is God. There's God the Father. There is God the Son. There is God, the Holy Spirit. So the question then becomes, which God are you talking about? Which one are you talking about? He says, Acts 20, 28. The church of God, 
that he has purchased with his own blood. Now, which member of the Godhead shed their blood? Because when I read Leviticus chapter 17 and verse number 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Which member of the Godhead put on flesh? It wasn't the Father. It wasn't the Spirit. So by process of elimination, it had to be the Son. And guess what? Since it was the Son, it's still Christ. So when Paul says, take heed unto yourselves and the flock over to which the Holy Ghost has made you overseer to feed the church of God, and the God whom he's referring to is the second member of the God, he's still talking about Christ. Yes, sir. You see, you're not going to be able to get around Christ and the church. And so Jesus is the owner of the church. The church belongs to him because he shed his blood for it. He paid for it. Now, as I think about this, I'm a little bit older now. So when I go home, uh, uh, my parents, they go home, and, they, and my parents still got, still got older stuff in the house, right? Just like most people's parents do. They got older stuff. And sometimes me and my brother, my brother's here, we joke with our parents. Mama, Dad, when you going to get rid of that stuff? When you going to get rid of that flat screen TV? When you going to get rid of that VCR? When you going to get rid of that DVD player? And you know what my parents say? It's mine. <laughs> I paid for it. You know what Jesus can say about the church? It's mine. I paid for it. I shed my blood for it. And so when we think about the church, we need to stop thinking about the building because people say all of the time, you know what, we go in the church. Many people said that this morning. This morning is Easter Sunday. We go in the church. No, we are the church. The church is the people. Jesus shed his blood for the people. And so the church is the called out who have been redeemed and saved by the blood of Jesus. So when Jesus looks at us who are Christian, Jesus says, they mine. I paid for them. I shed my blood for them. Look, if you will, look at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Verse number 11, let's see if Jesus paid for the church. Let's see if the church belongs to him. Titus chapter 2, Paul says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to every man. Notice now, the grace of God that saves humanity because we're saved by the grace of God, it has appeared to everybody. And because that is true, on the day of judgment, when we stand before the God of heaven, there will be nobody who can say they don't know God. Because the grace of God has appeared to everybody. The grace of God has not only appeared to everybody, but the grace of God has appeared teaching us that denying uh, 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 ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world doing what? Verse number 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Believe it or not, friends and neighbors, family members, Jesus coming back. He's coming back. I know a lot of times we get so busy with life and we get so busy raising our children, trying to work, trying to make a dollar, trying to do this, trying to do that. And we, sometimes we forget that we lose sight of the fact we're just here for a short period of time. We're not, we're not designed to stay here forever. Jesus Christ is coming back. And, and, and you know what's going to happen because, you know, April's going to bring a lot of crazy events. And, uh, April's going to bring the eclipse. The eclipse on April the 8th. And then also, there's going to be this, this worldwide event where all these cicadas are going to be giving birth now. And, you, and you're going to have people talking about, you know what, that's the sign of the Lord coming back. <laughs> now, here's the thing. We don't know when he's coming back. But we do know he's coming back. Oh, yeah. And so Paul says what we need to be doing, we need to be looking for it. We need to be anticipating it. And he says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 14 who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us and purify himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Now, why is this important? The phrase peculiar people means a purchased people. A people who have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. So because sometimes we, we always like to put a, a, a negative spin on everything. Sometimes when people are people who compromise and people who always don't have no conviction, we might say, you know what, you know what, you've been bought. You've been bought. You ain't got no backbone. You ain't got no conviction. You know what, you just give yourself over to everyone. You've been bought. No, but from a positive standpoint, we've been bought. 
we've been bought by the blood of Jesus. Jesus shed his blood. We are a purchased people. We are a peculiar people. The, the, the word peculiar don't mean strange and weird and abnormal as we think. The word peculiar means we've been bought with a price. We've been purchased with the blood of Jesus. And so when you think about how much we cost, how much we are worth, we are worth the blood of Jesus Christ. So when you read 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9, when Peter says you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that means we've been bought. If you're a child of God this morning, you are valuable. You have worth. You have dignity. Because you've been bought with a price. And the price that you've been bought with is Jesus shedding his blood. An innocent man shedding innocent blood for guilty people. When you think about that, when you think about the church, that's why he's the owner. It belongs to him because he shed his blood for it. In the third place, not only he's the builder, the owner, he's the head of the church. In other words, everything got to go through him. He dictates what the church does and does not do. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 18. Before Jesus went back to heaven, Jesus had a little meeting with his apostles. And Jesus told them in Matthew chapter 28, and verse number 18, he came and said unto them, I want y'all to know this now. Before I leave, I want y'all to know that all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That's what I want you to know. It kind of reminds me, you know, at a certain age, you begin to trust your children. You start leaving your children at home with all of your valuables, all of your expensive furniture, the stuff that you got at the house. And so my older brother, who's not here, he's a year older than me. I got another brother two years younger than me. My mother began to leave us at home. And so you know what children do when they're home by themselves. You know, they like to play. They like to break stuff. They like to tear up stuff. And I can remember, my mother always, before she would leave, she would give us the most important set of instructions before she left that house. One of which was, number one, don't let nobody in my house. Number two, don't be playing in my house. And number three, when I come back, because she was coming back, everything better be in place when I get back. Before Jesus got ready to go to heaven. He gave his apostles the most important instructions before he left because he wanted to understand, even though I'm leaving, just like my parents, I'm still in control. I'm still in charge. So I just want y'all to know, even though I'm going away, I'm still in control. I still have all authority and power, and guess what? I will be back. So in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus wanted him to understand, it ain't nowhere you can go in heaven and earth where I don't have no jurisdiction. I got all power and all authority in heaven and in earth. In other words, it's not a place that you can go. It ain't a place that you can't hide where Jesus don't have no authority. Amen. And so what Jesus wants to understand is, even today, he got all authority. And because he has all authority, that simply means that he is the head. He has all rule, all authority, and all power. That power has often been delegated to humanity, but Jesus retains every, every last ounce of authority and power. It don't belong to us. It belongs strictly to Jesus. So when you read the New Testament, what you find out, not only does Jesus have all authority and all power, Colossians chapter 1, Paul says that because he's the head, he has all preeminence. He has all preeminence. Jesus is first in everything. He has the dominion. He has the superiority. Why? Because he has the preeminence. It's interesting. When you read 3 John chapter 9, verse number 9, you read about a man by the name of Diotrephes. The Bible says about Diotrephes. Diotrephes loved to have the preeminence in the church. And what you find out is you have many people in religion today just like Diotrephes. Many people think they run the show. And they fail to realize they ain't running nothing. Because Jesus has all authority. He has all the preeminence. So whereas the Bible says that Diotrephes loved to have preeminence, where well, he failed to realize Jesus got all the authority. 
He got all the preeminence. He got all the power. So when we think about Christianity, what we need to keep firmly fixed in our minds is this thing belongs to Jesus. Jesus is the reason for everything in Christianity. I don't care how many degrees a person may have. I don't care how smart they may be. Nobody has more authority than Jesus. And it's amazing. You know, when we go through these different sections of life, we go through these sections of life, you go to the airport, they got authority at the airport. You can't just go to any gate you want to and get on any plane you want to. That ticket confines you to the authority placed on that ticket. You go to the hospital, they got authority in the hospital. You can't just go to anybody room you want to. They got authority at the courthouse. If you don't believe me, try that judge. He got a bailiff standing over there in the corner with that thing on the side of him. He'll make you respect his authority. Why am I saying all of that? We can respect authority at the courthouse, at the hospital, at the airport, but the one area that we don't want to respect authority is in religion. Jesus got all authority. We got to have some authority for what we do. Why? Because Jesus gave us the authority because he's the head. Jesus says, all power and all authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. So what you do, because you recognize I got all the authority, go ye into all of the nations and teach them the gospel, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Notice now, Jesus says, since I got all authority, you go forth and you teach people the gospel and you baptize them in the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Jesus is the head. He got all authority. And finally, when we think about the relationship between Jesus and the church, he's the builder, he's the owner, he's the head, but more importantly, he's the savior. Jesus is the savior of the body. Make no mistake about it. When you think about Christianity, the reason why we can appreciate Christianity is because we got a savior. We got a savior like no other. So when you read that golden text in the Bible, John 3, 16, how many people woke up this morning? You got them Easter text? Y'all got them Easter text? Y'all, y'all got them? Yeah. Four, five, six o'clock in the morning, folks text you. The means with Easter. And without fail, most people will text you John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not pray but have everlasting life. The reason why that exists is because of verse number 17. You ever thought about that? John 3, 16 exists because of John 3, 17. For God sent not his son into the world to, to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. The world is already messed up. It's been messed up, and it's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse before it gets better. So what man needs to do, man needs to appreciate the fact that we got a Savior who's going to make it better in the terms of spirituality. And so Jesus came to be our Savior. When you're coming through downtown Atlanta, right over by Georgia State University, there's a big old sign that says, Jesus saves. And he does. Make no mistake about it. He does save. But the question becomes, how does he save? You see, it's not a matter of if he saves. We know he saves because he's the Savior. But how does he save? Look, if you will, look at Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Most people can read John 3.16 and fail to realize that that's Jesus talking. Why is that important? Because when you read John 3.16, John 3.16 is not isolated from John 3.5. Where he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish. John 3.5 says, Jesus told Nicodemus, man, you got to be born again. That's how you say it. You got to be born again. So in Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 8, the Bible says, though he were a son, yet learned he obedient by the things in which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. Notice, pay attention to it. How does he save? He saves when you obey. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all those that obey him. So the question then becomes, does Jesus save? Yes, he does. How does he save? When we obey. Jesus is the savior of all mankind. John 4, 42, he came to save all men. Now, somebody may say, well, that's a contradiction. 
because if he's the savior of all mankind, Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Now, which one is it? Is he the savior of all mankind, or is he the savior of the body? We got a predicament, or do we? No, we don't. We don't have a contradiction. We don't have a problem. We don't have a predicament. When you put both of them together, John 4, 42, John 3, 16, and you put them together with um, Ephesians chapter 5, Jesus is, in fact, the savior of all humanity. But he wants all humanity in the body. There's no contradiction. The reason why he's the savior of the body, because he died for everybody. But when those who are saved, when they obey him, he puts them in the body. And so when Paul says he is the savior of the body, do understand this. He died for everybody, but he puts the saved in one place, in the body. Now, if you think that's foreign to God, have you read about Noah? What happened in the days of Noah? In the days of Noah, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Noah built an ark to the saving of his family, his household. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, built an ark to the saving of his house. And everybody in Noah's family got into the ark, and guess what? They were saved when the world was destroyed. Now, let me ask you all a question about Noah. Does anybody in here, does anybody agree that Noah was saved in the ark, right? Everybody agree with that? We all cool with that? Yeah. Let me ask you another question. What happened to the rest of the world? Noah, his wife, his three, wi his three sons and their wives, eight people in that ark with animals two by two. They were in that one ark. They were saved. So we can all agree that Noah was saved in that one ark, right? And we can also all agree that the rest of the world was drowned, right? Do you know what y'all just did to the rest of the world? Y'all just drowned the rest of the world. So when I look at Noah and I see that God, because people always say, you know what, God can do whatever he want to do. He sure can. God put salvation in one place in Noah's day. He put salvation in one place in the Old Testament when they had that Old Testament tabernacle. So by the time you get to the New Testament and God sent his son to be the Savior, because in Luke chapter 19 and verse number 10, Jesus said, I am come to seek and to save that which is lost. And God put salvation in one man, and that man is Jesus. And Jesus put salvation in one place in his body. There is no contradiction. So what you have, you got Jesus. Luke chapter 19 and verse number 10. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, does it make you feel good when somebody goes out of their way to come see you? It makes you feel some kind of way, right? Somebody took time out of their busy and hectic schedule to go out of their way to come see you. Jesus, he said, came to seek. And to save the lost. You know what Jesus did in essence? Jesus went out of his way. To come save us. And so what Jesus wants us to do in turn. is He wants us to respond to him. Because he went out of his way. When he didn't have to do it. To come to earth. To die for you and I. So that we can be saved. He went out of his way. The reason I know he went out of his way. Because he was perfect. He didn't have to do it. And so he went out of his way to save us. So what we need to do today, we need to obey him, and we can be in that one place of salvation in Christ. Because he's the savior of the body. And so what we have in Christianity, what we have in New Testament Christianity is the man and the plan. You can't separate it. Some people will say, you know, I just want the man. I don't want the plan. 
But let me tell you, my friends, the man is the plan. And you can't separate the man from the plan. In Acts chapter 8 and verse number 5, when Philip went down to Samaria, the Bible says he preached Christ unto them. But later in Acts chapter 8 and verse number 12, the Bible says, but when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the name of Jesus and the kingdom of God, they were baptized, both men and women. You know what Philip was preaching? The man and the plan. Christ and the church. So when you think about New Testament Christianity, when you walk away from here today, what I want you to understand is, just like you can't separate cake and ice cream, just like you can't separate macaroni and cheese, peanut butter and jelly, earth, wind, and fire, Frankie Bevel and Mays, Sonny and Cher, I mean, whatever the association is, just like you can't separate those things, you cannot separate Christ and the church. This morning, do you recognize that Jesus is the Savior of all humanity? He's the Savior of all mankind. Before we close, a quick, I want you to look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And the lesson be yours so y'all can get out of here. 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. Reiterating what we said earlier. 1 Timothy 2, 4. Notice God. Look at God. 1 Timothy 2, 4 and 5. Paul says, this is God's ideal will. Who would have all men to be saved? God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to die for our sins. Because he wants everybody to be saved. He wants everybody to be in fellowship with him. He wants everybody to be in communion with him. He wants everybody to have the right to eternal life. That's the God that we serve. That's the God of whose image that we're made. He wants everybody to be saved. Not just white people, not just black people, not just Hispanic people. He wants everybody. He wants everybody to be saved. But how does God do it? Verse number five. First Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Is Jesus our Savior? Absolutely. How does he save when we obey? This morning, you can't separate Christ and the church. You can't do it. Try as you may, you can't tear it apart. It's forever linked. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. But somebody say, well, what if I don't believe? Oh, I don't believe that. Do you not realize just because you don't believe a biblical truth, God is not going to change it. Y'all realize that? Just because you don't believe it, God don't change it. What has to happen when you don't believe something, since God is not going to change it, what has to happen is you have to change. And the way that you change, the Bible calls that repentance. It's a changing of the mind which leads to a change or reformation in your thoughts and in your behavior. You have to change because God's word is not going to change. You know the same word that they had 2,000 years ago, what we got today? Reason being, Jesus told his apostles in Matthew 28 that we read, he got all authority and power, and he's coming back. He's coming back to judge what he left. And because he's coming back to judge what he left, we got to give him intact what he left behind. And that's his church, as Paul says, without spot or without blemish. This morning, don't you want to be a child of God? Don't you want to be a part of Christ's church? Part of that association that's forever linked? Christ and the church because he is the savior of the body. Salvation is in the body of Christ. What is this morning? How can you do that? You got to believe the gospel. The gospel is the message, the unchanging message that Jesus died. Jesus was buried, and he was resurrected. He was resurrected, Romans 4.25. He was delivered for our offenses, and he was raised for our justification. Jesus was resurrected. The word resurrection comes from a Greek word and a stasis. It means to stand again. Death thought he had him. But three days later, he stood up again. When death thought he had his grips around Jesus, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 18, Jesus says, I am he that liveth and was dead. There was a time when I was dead. 
but I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of hell and death. And because Jesus is alive, you can live a new life in Christ. This morning, how can you do it? He died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. You got to believe that. Jesus says in John 8, 21 and John 8, 24, that if you don't believe, you'll die in your sins. You know, it's one thing to die, die with bad health. It's one thing to die alone. It's one thing to die at odds with your family and friends and your enemies. But it's another thing altogether to die in your sins, to die outside of Christ. It's a different type of crime when you die outside of Christ. That's why Paul says, we don't weep as others who have no hope. And so you want to make sure that you are in Christ, but you got to believe in that. And then you got to repent. Change your mind. Make that confession before witnesses that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Make that same confession that Peter made in Matthew chapter 16. Not only that, you got to be buried with Jesus Christ in his water right here. And when you're buried with him, the same thing that Jesus underwent, how he died on the cross, and he was buried in that tomb, but he rose again. When you get buried in this tomb right here, Paul says in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 4, you'll be raised to walk in the newness of life. Don't you want a new life? Don't you want a second chance? No, we all deserve a second chance at this thing called life. Because what happens as we live and as we get older and as we live through our life, sin messes it up the first time. So we need a second chance. And the only way we can get that second chance is through Jesus Christ. So this morning, if you're not a Christian, why don't you take advantage of that second chance? Come give your life to Christ while we stand together and sing our invitation song.